I just realized. Oh, hello, party people. Welcome, welcome. Welcome. Uh, we're just going to give everyone a just a minute to jump in just while while we're doing that. Uh, guys, if you could just let me know, please, if the audio and slides are coming through. OK, that would be great. I just pop the slides up <clears throat> now. You can see a couple of thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Um, awesome team. We'll look pumped to, to have you guys uh, all here for today. Look, as we're going through the content, um, I'm going to have some time for Q&A. So uh, very happy for you guys to throw any general banter into the chat box as we go through. But if you've got a question and you want to make sure that your question gets answered, uh, please just pop that into the Q&A box itself. That would be great. Uh, thanks, everyone, for confirming in the uh in the chat as well uh, what's going on here can uh can someone just confirm i'm just uh, trying to firm up with my tech here can you guys see a q a box or am i missing something here matt says yes there is a q a box Wait, oh there's the q a box okay i see don't worry it's i have used zoom before so you know we're safe we're safe over here um Awesome, guys. Well, look, uh, today we're talking about how to invest tax smart in the new financial year. And firstly, I just want to say nice one to you guys in jumping on um, and looking to get on the front foot with this stuff, because I find that a lot of people when it comes to tax, they only really think about tax after the financial year has finished. But the reality is that there's a much bigger opportunity when you're smart with this stuff at the start of the financial year. It means that you've got a ton of time to implement things that are going to save you tax in this financial year, sure, but also for all of the financial years uh, to, to come. And so I'm pumped to, to get into it. Look, uh, for anyone that's been seeing our content for a while, you know that saving tax is one of my favorite levers that can help people get ahead because you're effectively using the rules smarter to your advantage and uh, it allows you to actually get ahead without having to save more or sacrifice more, essentially. Um, guys, I just wanted to give a big shout out to our event partner in Perla. Um, Perla's mission is to, to help people create what they call boring long-term wealth. And that is deeply aligned with the, the philosophy that we have at Pivot Wealth as well. Uh, if you're not already familiar with Perla, then you absolutely should be. So uh, definitely check them out. Um, we, we've we been we've done a lot of collabs with them uh, over the years and uh, there's no you know commercial relationship there. We just know that uh, each other, they do good work and uh, they're pumped to, to be partnering up with them for this event. Uh, as well guys a couple of questions on the recording yes we are recording yes we uh, will push that out off the back of today but um my jokes are funny alive so if you stick around live that'd be great i've also got something special at the end to share with you guys and it'll just be for the people that are on live as well sorry for anyone that has to jump early all right uh, guys, if you're, if this is your first time, I, in fact, if anyone's first time with one of our events, I'd love to hear from you in the, in the chat. Um, also for any OGs that have been at it for a while, uh, uh Ash, welcome Ash. Thank you. Um, great. Yeah. Great to have a bunch of first timers here. Anna, Ian, uh, Sophia, sorry. I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, there's a ton actually on there guys. So welcome everyone back. Lucia, Jay, Ryan, uh, there's a heap there, guys. So, uh, welcome. Firstly, if you're if you're not already across um, our content, we do a, a bunch of stuff on pretty much most of the things. So, we do a heap of events like this. We've already got our next event scheduled for a couple of months' time, which you can check out on Eventbrite. Um, and there's also a heap of free education on our socials and the Mo Money podcast as well. If you're into podcasts, uh, the bunch of a bunch we've just notched over 400 episodes on the podcast. So there's a heap of stuff in there if you want to, uh, you know, understand the rules better and how to use them to your advantage. Um, we've also got a couple of OGs on the on the chat as well, James, 
uh, Raj, welcome Maria, um, Ellie. So uh, awesome, guys. Well, look, I'm pumped to get into it. Um, oh, actually, sorry, one thing. Subtle, not subtle promo. My uh, third book is coming out in September. So in just a couple of months' time, uh, it's called Virgin Millionaire. And basically, it's uh, your step-by-step -step guide to your first million and beyond, as it says in the text. This is like hot off the press. The cover just got released. Uh, that was a whole thing. But anyway, that's a conversation for another day. But um, uh, it's out in book places. You can check it out on this books page on our website or on uh, Amazon or all the places as well. Uh, it's a in this book, there is actually a ton of detail around tax, two chapters specifically on tax, tax strategies and tax structures, both of the concepts that we're going to cover off today. And so it gets right into the um, the nitty gritty details and what you can do there. So uh, if you like this sort of stuff and you want to dive a bit deeper, uh, definitely worth a check out there as well. And uh, if you're not already on our mailing list, and particularly for people that are based in Sydney, we are going to have a bit of a party to celebrate in September. So, uh, you know, jump on, jump on the newsletter and you'll be the first to know when that comes out as well now guys uh just for the lawyers out there i was never here this never happened um but guys you know we're talking about some potentially some pretty big decisions here so please don't rush out and do anything life-changing off the back of what we cover strongly suggest you seek out personalized advice uh on last if the book's on kindle I think so. I think that's what they're doing. I'm super excited, actually, uh, that this time is the the first time we're, we're turning the book into an audio book. So I've got those studio dates in the calendar. Uh, be interested. I'm probably be sick of my own voice uh, after you know however long of of actually talking that out. But um, the audio book is coming to you as well. All right, guys. So look, I know that uh, everyone's situation is unique, but when it comes to this stuff, there are three challenges specifically around tax that really do hold people back. First is the fact that the rules are really complicated. They're really long. There's literally thousands of pages of tax legislation in Australia, difficult to interpret, difficult to action. There's also a heap of unknown unknowns. And I find that this is one of the biggest ones when it comes to tax that People just don't know what they might be missing. And if there is something smarter or there's something potentially wrong with what they're thinking about. So uh, that creates a real challenge. And that good help in this space, specifically around tax, is really hard to find. Some of the changing dynamics of the you know, accountants, financial advisors, how that all works, uh, it's, it's, it creates some, some challenges there. And we're going to get into that in a little bit more detail as we go through today. But what happens as a result for most people is that they end up stuck and they end up stuck, not stuck doing nothing, but often people are just stuck doing the same thing that they've been doing in the past. And what that means is that they're often missing out on the opportunity to be getting more money out of what they have today. And so what we've found is that there, uh, there's three main areas that you need to get right when it comes to your tax, when it comes to your money more broadly as well, which is your structure, strategy, and solution. Structure is about all making it um, easy to save, making it easy to manage your money, but making it really clear how much money you've got to work with when it comes to tax saving strategies, tax planning, investing, paying down debt, saving, all of those things. That ties into the next piece, which is your strategy. And for um, in the strategy, it's really about understanding the different pathways that can take you from where you are right now to where you want to be with your money and choosing the very best one for you. And then the third element is the solution. So the investments that you use to back up your strategy. And here you want to make sure that you're getting reliable, consistent progress over time. And importantly, that you're avoiding the downsides and setbacks and momentum killing mistakes. Now, today, we're not uh, we're not going to get too deep into investments or anything like that. But I just wanted to put this slide up to call out that you do really need to nail all three of these areas if you want to do well with your money. Because the reality is that if any one of the three is missing, it ends up dragging down on the others. It doesn't matter how good your strategy and investments are. If you suck at managing your money and you don't know how much money you've got to invest or strategize with, it's almost impossible. Similarly, good structure, good strategy, bad investments, you blow up your cash. Good structure, good investments, bad strategy, um, you're leaving a whole heap of money on the table as well. And so uh, th you can think about this in the context of tax, but as you're planning your money more broadly or planning the moves that you're going to do, make sure that you give each of these areas the attention that it deserves because the one plus one plus one is equal to about 53. You, you want to really leverage the power of all of them combined is much more than any one individual element on its own. So guys, uh, look, we're going to start with the basics around tax and um 
you probably know some of this already. I'm going to start slow and then I'm going to build on, on it from there. In Australia, we work under the marginal tax rate system. So basically, we have a progressive tax rate uh, that applies on different levels of income. Um, you only get one tax rate for all of your income. And so at the end of the financial year and like the financial year just finished that basically when you do your tax return, the ATO just adds up all of your income from all the different sources. How much did you receive for a salary? How much did you receive from interest income in your bank account? What was the dividend income from your, uh, from your investment portfolio? What was the rental income on investment properties? Basically all of the income from all sources adds up to give you an, what, what's called your assessable income. And that is the number that you pay tax on. But tax rates are different for different tax entities. And apologies for the jargon, but a tax entity is basically anything with a tax file number. So every single one of you guys listening in today, is uh, you are your own tax entity. Your partner is a tax entity if you have a partner. Your super fund has a tax file number. That is a tax entity. Then you can also use investment bonds, trusts, companies, and other things for investing. Gets a little bit complicated, but there is some pretty big opportunities here. So I'm going to dive into that in a little bit of detail uh, as we go through as well, because the tax rates are different for different entities. Calling out early here that for individuals, so for PAYG, pay as you go employee, so basically any regular employee, there's a lot of things that you can do to cut your tax bill. You can maximize your deductions. You can do prepayments. You can do a whole bunch of different things. And that will bring mean that you pay less tax, you get a bigger tax refund. But by far and away, the biggest opportunity to save tax is when you invest. Because if you think about what money success really is, that everyone's got a slightly different sort of version of what this actually is, but it's essentially that you have enough money in investments that your investments are giving you an income so that you no longer have to work for a paycheck. Because if you've got enough money in investments that you it will pay you your salary without you having to work, then it means that you're then working out of choice as opposed to necessity. And so what that means is that over time, you're going to build literally tens of thousands, probably $100,000 or more of investment income. And paying a little bit of tax on that versus paying uh, you know, a lot of tax, that's going to be huge on an annual basis. And so when we talk about investing tax smart and, and the, the way that this, this session today was sort of came about is that the, the, the tax numbers are huge, which you're going to see in some of the examples that come up. The opportunity for saving is really huge. And so getting into the uh, personal marginal tax rate, so MTR, marginal tax rate, these are the tax brackets in Australia. They just changed from the 1st of July. Thank you, stage three tax cuts. Um, and basically the first $18,000, at first $18,200 that you earn, you don't pay any tax. Then when your income goes above 18,000, you pay tax at 16% up to 45,000. Then from 45 to 135,000, you pay at 30%. 135 to 190,000, you pay 37%. And then above 190,000, that's the new bracket for the top marginal tax rate, you're paying tax at 45%. There is a couple of percent Medicare levy, which adds on top of these rates. But basically, it means that if your income is above 45,000 in Australia, paying at least 30 cents in every dollar in tax. One thing that confuses people, and I think I've actually got this on a future slide, is that people think that when, if your income goes from, say, 189,000 to 191,000 and pushes you into the top marginal tax bracket, that you immediately stay, start paying more tax on the income that you earn below 190,000. That is not true. The, the, the different tax rate applies only on the income earned in that bracket. So even if your income is $1 million a year, you still pay no tax on the first $18,200 that you earn. You still pay 16% tax on the income earned between $18,000 and $45,000 and so on and so forth. And so I'll just bust that myth out of the gate. Um, earning a higher income is always going to be better for you after tax. But then if we compare the uh, personal marginal tax rates 
to the tax rates of other entities, you can see where the opportunities start kicking in. And so if, you, uh, if you're investing in, you know, today we're talking about how to invest tax smart. Let's say you're investing in a share portfolio. You, if you own the share portfolio yourself, then all of the income that you receive from that share portfolio adds to your personal assessable income and then gets taxed at your personal marginal tax rate. But you don't need to own your, your, your share portfolio. You can own that share portfolio in your partner's name. You can own it in joint names with a partner. You can own it in your super fund, under a company, under a trust, or under an investment bond as well. And each of them have different tax rates that apply. The super tax rate has a maximum tax that's applied of 15%. Company and investment bonds have a maximum tax rate of 30%. With a trust that there's a bit of a... Uh, a trust doesn't actually have a tax rate. I'm going to talk about trust in a bit more detail, but effectively with a trust that you need to distribute every dollar of assessable income to another taxpayer, and then that income is taxed at their marginal tax rate or whatever their effective tax rate um, ultimately is. And so uh, you can see that there's quite a difference in terms of the tax rates. And you can see that like superannuation is the lowest tax rate of any of the structures that are there. Now, I'm not saying rush out and put your all of your money into super because you need money that's outside of super, but super is the most effective from a tax perspective, the most effective place to invest. With um, When you're investing, so there are two parts to your investment income that you receive. The first is the income that you receive. So if you've got an, um, money in a high interest savings account, you receive interest income. If you've got dividends, uh, if you sorry, if you own shares, shares pay out dividends. So when you own a share, you're buying a tiny little slice of a company. When that company generates a profit, they, they typically will pay out part of the profit to their shareholders, and that's paid in the form of a dividend. So that's an income. Uh, when you've got a rental income, you or when you've got an investment property, you get rental income on that investment property. And so income that you receive in your personal name from your investments owned in your personal name are taxed at your marginal tax rate, even if that income is negative. And I'll come back to that point. The other part of the other way that you benefit when you invest is through capital gains. So you buy a share for $10, you hope that over time it's going to grow to be worth more than $10. When you sell that share, you make a capital gain. Now, capital gains are taxed sort of at the same rate, but with a 50% discount if you've held the investments for longer than 12 months. So if you buy a share and you make $100 on that share, if you sell it and you've owned it for less than 12 months, that full $100 gets added to your, your, your taxable income and then gets taxed at your marginal tax rate. If you've owned the same share for 12 months and one day, it's considered a long-term investment under the tax rules. And basically the $100 gain gets a 50% discount. So only $50 adds onto your assessable income. Only $50 is taxed at your marginal tax rate. And so there's a pretty significant saving um, that, that's on offer there by, by leveraging that rule. Now, in this example here, I've just showed the power of tax planning across a family unit. And so I've got a couple, I've got mum and dad, I've got a couple of kids, um, a, a minor child, 15 years old, an 18 year old, and then I've got a super fund and a company. Now, in this example, I've said, what if you were to own, uh, earn $10,000 of investment income? And so in, um, in this case, we've got mum is on a tax rate plus Medicare levy 39%. She's going to pay tax at $3,900. Then we've got dad. He's uh, on a 21% tax rate, going to pay $2,100. For the 15, for minor children, they're taxed on investments at the top marginal tax rate, a bit of a weird quirk to the rules, 47%. So they're going to pay 4,700 in tax. The 18 year old daughter, she's taking a gap year because she's trying to find herself. So she doesn't have any other income. Her tax rate is zero. She wouldn't pay any tax on that income. The same income earning your super fund, $1,500 in tax. In the company, $3,000 in tax. And you see that there's quite a lot of variation between the, the different. Um, uh, the different tax paying entities that essentially the highest tax rate, $4,700 on 10 grand of income. So you're basically giving up 50%. The lowest, you keep the full 10 grand, which you can then reinvest to grow your investments even faster. And so there is a big 
big uh, difference and it's a big opportunity, therefore, for you to be smart with your tax planning. Uh, getting a couple of questions here. Um, how does an education bond compare with a trust if both are used to invest into the same asset? So, look, I must confess I'm not deeply familiar with all of the rules around education bonds, but we do use a lot of general investment bonds. And with an investment bond, the difference between a a, a trust, you can invest in the same in the same actual underlying investments. <clears throat> but the difference is with an investment bond, if you leave your money invested for 10 years or more, you don't pay any capital gains tax on the investment. Whereas if you own the same investments in a trust and you make a capital gain, that gain needs to have tax paid on it. So that's the simplest way that I can explain. Um, Does the fifty does the capital gain fifty percent discount apply to Australian taxable property shares if you're Australian if you're an Australian tax resident but not yet a permanent resident or citizen? Uh, I believe I I'm I believe that this applies for it's based on your tax residency status. That's my understanding. I must confess I'm not 100% sure because it does get a little bit murky with the rules on for, uh, PR and different visa categories and some of the tax treatment that's there. Um, but my understanding is that it's based on the on your tax residency, not your actual residency. Paul's got a question in the family tax planning example. <clears throat> not sure how the 15 year old daughter, daughter earning 2K pays maximum tax rate. So basically, there's this rule that says that for minor children, if they receive passive income from investments, they are taxed at, they're taxed in the top marginal tax rate. Because what was happening was a lot of people that had, um, a lot of quite wealthy people were using their children effectively as like tax shields and allocating them big chunks of money every year. So the government tightened up the rules so that basically if they're working at Maccas, they they get they pay normal tax rates as a normal worker. But um, if they're if they're earning investment income, then it's different. Paul says, what was what is the tax rate from investing in crypto? The the crypto investing tax rate is the same as, as other tax rates. It's it's the same capital gains tax rate, it's the same 50% capital gains tax discount, uh, and it's the same income rate as well. So uh I'll show you why uh, tax planning is crucial and basically got an example here showing if you were to invest money, how that would grow over time. This is just using simple compound interest and based on the long-term share market return in Australia uh, of 8.7%. In this example, we've got you starting with $0 today. So basically, if you've got $0 today and you want to get started investing and you were to save and invest $1,000 every single month. So over the 12 months of the year, you save $12,000. Then uh, over a 10-year period, $12,000 a year, 10 years, you'd save and invest a total of $120,000. But based on the market return, you're going to have some growth on the, the the value of the investments. You're going to have some dividends that you can, um, you can re reinvest. And basically, after 10 years, you'd have $190,000. You put in $120,000 and it's grown to be worth $190,000. You keep that going for 20 years and you put in a total of 240,000, but your money's grown to 642 grand. 30 years, 360 grows to 1.7 mil and 40 years, 480 goes to 4.2 mil. Now, this is the power of compound interest. And I get that, you know, the reason that I put this one in is because sometimes when I get into all this stuff about tax planning, people go, oh, what's that like? I don't have, I don't have 10 grand of investment income, so I don't really need to worry too much about that. But the reality is, if you're investing consistently, your momentum builds and it builds slow at first, but it reaches critical mass and starts seriously accelerating from there. And so if you're investing consistently, you are going to be building up quite a lot of money over time. And so you want to be smart with this stuff now, because while the tax bills not, might not be huge today, uh, they can uh, they they will grow, unfortunately, over time. Now, tax, tax bills means that you're making money, so there's a bit of a good thing there, but you don't want to pay any more than your fair share. 
And I've got another example here showing if your investment income was $100,000 a year, investing the money through an investment company, or it's the same rate as an investment bond, so um, you know, investment company or bond, versus your marginal tax rate. So if your 100 grand of income here is taxed at the top marginal tax rate, you're going to pay $47,000 in tax. If it's taxed through an investment company or a bond, it's going to pay no more than $30,000 in tax. And so the tax saving to you is $17,000 every single year. That's an extra $17,000 that you can spend if you want to, but probably slightly smarter to keep saving, keep investing and grow your investments faster. These are big, big numbers that we're talking about. And so the this is what I mean when I say that the opportunity is really there for smart investors to be smarter with the rules and make sure that you're keeping more of your hard-earned money. Uh, a couple more questions, and I uh, love seeing these questions come through, guys. Uh, Armin says, for under 18's tax rate, what is their tax rate if they earn salary from a store and invest that into shares and ETFs? Hmm. A good question. I my understanding is that the passive income is a, for minor children is taxed at, at the top marginal tax rate. I'm sure, if they do it themselves, then um, I don't believe that it's different. I don't believe that it's different. It is a good question, though. But uh, see, you you wouldn't expect if people are only doing a few shifts at Macca's and investing the difference you wouldn't expect them to be paying, uh, you know, to have a lot of investment income that's there. I might actually look into that one though and, and put it into the Q&A section on our weekly newsletter. So thanks for the question. Uh, Caesar says, if we distribute funds to a company, can they be used for personal spending without the company having to pay an individual which will then incur tax? Uh, the short answer is no. Um, if you want, if you, but there are, there's a whole bunch of different things that you can do if you're if you've got multiple different tax entities, trust companies, etc., and you're looking to optimize your tax. But ultimately, if you need to be spending your money, you need to pay tax on that money. Like if it's for your personal spend and your lifestyle, you're probably going to need to pay tax on it at some level. What I'm talking about here, though, is that if you want to, if your goal is to crank your investments then uh, you can do it within a, an ecosystem of entities that means that you don't need to take the money out and therefore you don't need to pay personal tax on the same on the same income. But look, if you're going down this path, and I'm sure I've got this in a future slide, if you're going down this path, then you, you should be getting advice because we're talking about big numbers, there's big opportunities, there's big costs of getting this wrong. So you, you want to make sure that you've got you, you know the ideal approach for you don't just you know listen to some bullet points in a webinar and make million dollar decisions off the back of it. Rit says, how does CGT apply for selling land which settled three months back, but the contract was signed last July? Geez, guys, you, you're firing some tough questions at me today, I must say. Um, look, my understanding is that the your a property is deemed to have been acquired based on the date of the of the settlement. And so when you settle on a property, the property ends up being yours. And my understanding is that that, that is where the um, capital gains start accruing from effectively. Hope that helps. Michael says, in this sort of family arrangement, is in this sort of family arrangement better for a non-working partner with 18K of tax-free income than a debt recycling option, paying no tax on the investment or offsetting the debt against the tax of the primary income earner. I think that the question here is, is it better to, maybe you can clarify this for me, Michael, but is it better to invest if you've got a partner that's not working and therefore has a tax-free threshold available to them? Is it better to invest in their name uh, or to invest through the through some the primary income earner through a debt recycling strategy i think that's the question and look the that's a that's a question that's a question that it's it's hard for me to, uh, that's a question that i could answer with some financial modeling tools but it would depend on 
What are you going to do in the short term? You know, how long is that lower income going to um, going to continue for? How high is the primary income earner's income? How much interest would you would you be paying on the tax deductible debt recycling debt? What are you investing into? And therefore, what is the income that comes with that investment? So there's a bit of stuff to get into to answer that one uh, that one correctly. My Yeah, particularly if it's short term, I think that probably the 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 key factor there is is the ta is the the no income partner only going to have no income for a short period of time? Because if that's the case, then you might get some tax savings for a year or two or three, but then uh, you're going to pay you know a lot more tax. Um, but yeah, that's something that you'd probably want to crunch the numbers on there, Michael. I hope that helps. Henry says, how does the tax, oh my goodness, guys, these ones are complicated today. How does the tax apply on an informal trust account held under adult name with a minor as a beneficiary? For example, I set up a self-wealth minor account with an adult's tax file number. All right, so if you're investing for your kids and the um, and the kids, uh, there's a few different ways that you can do that. You can invest in your name and you just own the assets. You pay the tax to the kids. You can invest in the kid's name, then they own the assets. They pay the tax, but it's punitive because the tax rates are higher for kids. Or you can invest under an informal um, trust type arrangement where you're owning the um, investments in trust for the children as well. Um, when you do it like that, that generally the, there's a deep dive on this on our website. So, because it's a fairly complex topic. So I'm just trying to think of the, the best way to explain it, but there's a couple of advantages of doing it with the informal trust type arrangement. One of the biggest ones being that you can transfer the investments fully to the children in the future when you want to shut down the trust generally without incurring capital gains tax. There's a there's an ATO ruling that's on that. Uh, but in the meantime, you pay the tax on the, the income as it bubbles away. I would encourage you with that one because it is fairly complicated and dry that uh, you you check out the blog on the pivotwealth, pivotwealth.com.au forward slash blog. Um, you might need to do a bit of scrolling to find that one, but it is, or you could just Google it and it would probably just, just come up. Um, I was advised miners' income goes under our personal as it's adult investing. Not if you're investing with your children, if you apply for your kid's tax file number and then you own the investment accounts in their name generally. How do dividend reinvestment plans or dividend substitution plans work with tax? E.g. companies like AFI or ARG have both. What are the differences? Honestly, guys, where are these questions coming from today? I do not know. Dividend reinvestment, dividend substitution plan. Not sure. I'm not super familiar with listed investment companies, which is what AFI and ARG do. I've got had a bit of exposure to them, but I'm not sure. I know with a dividend reinvestment plan that you, when you get, say you get a $100 dividend and you choose to reinvest it into the company that you, you basically have to pay tax on the $100 as if you earned it as income. Um, uh, even though you're reinvesting it into the shares and then it's just basically like you buying $100 worth of shares and you get a new cost base for them. Personally, I don't really like dividend reinvestment plans because they're a bit complicated from a tax reporting perspective. But uh, yeah, that, that is effectively how it works. Dividend substitution plans, I'm not too familiar with those, I must confess. Um, I just have one more question, guys. I'm loving all these questions. Not the level of difficulty, but the volume of questions. Um, I'm loving seeing you guys leaning in on this. Um, uh, who, who? I'll I'll just take one more and then I'll crack on because I've still got a few slides to get through, and then I'm going to make sure that I push through quickly so that we can get into this Q and A more um, in the part in, at the end. Uh, who would one seek advice from on whether? setting up an investment company is worthwhile um well i've actually got that on a future slide but either an accountant or a financial advisor i feel like an, a financial advisor obviously i'm a little bit biased as a financial advisor but we're 
a financial advisor is probably a better place to be able to do this because they'll see how the investment company fits in with your financial plan, not just today, but into the years ahead. Whereas the accountant is more likely to look at what have you got right now and what are you thinking about doing right now and does it make sense right now as a, as a result? Whereas what an advisor does is say, okay, well, this is what, you know, you've got X amount of saving, you've got um, this amount that you're going to save in the next 12 months, but then that's projected to increase or decrease or increase and then decrease or whatever over these time periods. And therefore we know that we've got around, you know, this total amount that we could invest. Therefore, does an investment bond make sense? No, uh, investment company makes sense rather. So uh, yeah, that's my spin. I will talk a little bit more about that as well. Getting into guys, I'll, I'll just crack on it and keep those questions coming because I, I I'll, I'll crack on quickly and circle back on those as well. Touching on the different uh, types of tax entities that you can use and how they work. So with a trust, basically you need to stream income and gains to another tax paying entity. Trusts have a cost though to set them up. So there's a cost to operate um, a trust, which is generally you need to pay a setup and a registration cost. It's a, somewhere between two and 3,000, can be more if it's a complex trust, but about that, then each year you'll need to do a tax return. And so you need to do the tax return probably to, you know about the same cost, two to three thousand dollars, depending on what you've got in the trust as well. The big benefit of trusts though is that because you can stream income and gains, like we had the the question from Michael, I think it was talking about uh, we've got a partner, partners not earning a lot of income. Could we distribute income to them tax free? And so with a trust you can do that. If you've got a big share portfolio in a trust, at the end of the year you would you would just have X dollars of income that you need to distribute. And that, so say that's $20,000. You could choose, you know, if you don't need the money, um, you could you could not distribute it to you. But if your partner's got no other taxable income, you could distribute it to them and then not pay any tax at all, pretty much. Um, or, you know, if you both got high tax rates, you could look, do you have kids? Do you have adult kids that you could stream to? If you don't, then you could look at an investment company. And that can change every year. So if someone's earning more, you know, incomes are variable, then uh, you can change and shift the strategy. And that flexibility has a lot of value that comes with it. A downside of trust, though, is that trusts don't get a land tax exemption. And so if you own property inside a trust, you're going to pay tax on the property from dollar one of land that you own. Whereas individuals have a land tax-free threshold in most states. It is a bit different state by state, but you can own up to $700,000, $800,000 of investment land and not pay any land tax. And so that is a factor to consider. But if you're going to accumulate multiple properties over time, potentially less of an issue with some of the properties, but worth being aware of. Um, trust can use can combine with an investment company. It's generally a pretty good combo. And there's no right or wrong here, but generally, if you're thinking about does a trust make sense or does any tax entity make sense, you need to ensure that the benefit that you're going to receive from running that entity is going to be more, is going to be higher than the costs that you pay for setting it up and management and the costs, including your time in doing that. So generally, that means that you're going to have to have at least six figures in investment, so $100,000 plus at least um, for it to make sense. Or if you've got really strong savings capacity into the future, then a trust um, can make more sense as well. If you think it, it might make sense for you, then that just means it's time to explore. It doesn't mean that it's right. It just means that you should explore it further and understand it to, to determine if it is actually right for you. With investment bonds, um, they're basically through an investment bond, you can invest in pretty much anything you can invest into outside of an investment bond, pretty much. Uh, but the key rules with an investment bond, twofold. First is that income inside an investment bond is taxed inside the investment bond. It's not um, added to your taxable income. It doesn't need to be taken out of the investment bond. It's taxed internally inside the bond, very similar to a super fund. And I should just say that I know that this is a bit confusing with bonds. That A lot of people get confused thinking that it's like a, a corporate bond investment, sort of like the bond investments that you see inside a super fund. 
An investing bond in or an investment bond is just an investing account that has um, tax tax benefits and tax concessions and some rules to it. That it basically like a super fund, except it's not like you you can only with your super you can only you get the tax benefit, but you can only access your money if you're retired. Investing bonds you don't need to be retired, but you do need to meet their rules in order to get the tax concessions that come. And so the second big one, and I mentioned it already, is if you invest for 10 years or more, you don't pay any capital gains tax on that investment. With the bond as well, that they've got this 125% rule, which basically says that each year that you have the bond, you can only contribute new money into it at a maximum of 125% of however much you contributed in the first year. So basically in year one, you can contribute an unlimited amount to an investment bond. If you've got $100 million, you could put it in investment bond, no problem. But once you get once you get beyond year one, so say you put a hundred thousand dollars into an investment bond, or yeah, just say a hundred thousand dollars to make my math maths easy. It works at ten thousand or one thousand. Um, in the second year, you could only put in a maximum of one hundred and twenty five thousand dollars. Then in the third year, you can put in one hundred twenty five percent of one hundred twenty five thousand, so one hundred thirty seven thousand or something. Then um, if you don't contribute in any year, then your contribution for that year is going to be zero. And then the bond is effectively locked because 125% of zero is still zero. And so once, if you have a year and you don't put any money into a bond, you won't be able to put the money into the bond in the future. With investment bonds, the money is fully accessible. So you could invest money into an investment bond today and you could take it all out and close the bond down tomorrow if you wanted to or in a month's time or six months time or six years time, it's just if you did it in six years time, you're not going to get the tax concessions. You're not going to get the 10 year CGT discount that you, that you would have on the, um, on the, on the, on the bond if you'd held it for longer than, than 10 years. And so these uh, bonds, they used to be really expensive and and pretty average in terms of the investments that you could use in them, but they're getting pretty good these days. The tech is good. The costs have come down, and I think that they're um, a really you know really good way to look at for investing. Super, uh, the tax rates on super income is taxed at fifteen percent. Capital gains are taxed at a maximum rate of fifteen percent or ten percent if you've held your investments for twelve months or more. So that, like the fifty percent discount that you receive in your personal name in your super, you receive a five percent discount to take the tax rate from fifteen percent to ten percent. The investments can be the same as non-super. Super is not its own investment; it's just an investment account that has um, restrictions on access, essentially. And so those are the key tax entities. Now, um, they each have the place and the place for you depends on your strategy and where you're at. Worth noting as well, when it comes to your money, that there are these different stages that people go through. And so, you know, I mentioned at the start, super is a great place to, it's the most effective, the most tax effective place to invest, but it's not a great place to invest. If you're a first home buyer and you're trying to get into the property market, you don't want to be investing through your super probably because it's going to tie up all your cash and you're not going to have the money to get out. Similarly for bonds, investment bonds can be a great way to invest. But if you're if you're trying if you want the money within a 10-year period, not going to be great. But over time, more and more things start making sense as you progress with your money and you reach the new stage, and then a new set of um, good decisions gets unlocked. And so being aware of the entities uh, is really important. And you know, we had the question before about accountants. Um, or who's the right people to advise on. I feel that in the past, it was more accountants, but unfortunately with where we're at today, that uh, the accounting game has changed and like an accountant only charges a couple of hundred dollars to do a tax return. They are professionals that have, you know, years of experience, all these qualifications, all of these things. If they're only charging you $200, it means they can't really afford to spend very much time with you without losing money. And so I find that a lot of people get quite frustrated because they think that an accountant should be the answer, but they're probably not charging you enough to do what you want to do in most cases. And so that means that you've got to educate yourself and you may need to get some other advice, particularly if you're thinking about being tax smart with your investing, get some other advice like financial advice because tax planning is all baked into that. And then whether you do, do it through education or other advice or some sort of combination of the two, you can then direct a bit of traffic with your accountant and make sure that they're dotting the I's and crossing the T's, which is something that you absolutely want when it comes to this stuff. All right. So uh, I'm going to get into the investors. I'm going to go fast 
through this because I can see that there is still a ton of questions that are that are coming through and I'm keen to make time for them. And so the types of investments that you can choose, cash, debt, property, and crypto. Now, if you invest in cash, that basically all of the interest income is taxed at your marginal tax rate. Keep in mind that there's an after inflation return. So your cash is effectively going backwards. It's not going to get you rich saving money in a bank account because when you take tax off at your marginal tax rate, 30% or more, then you take inflation off. The real return on cash is, 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 is at best zero, at worst it's negative. Paying down uh, debt is a, is a really good way to get ahead um, and it's a good way to manage your risk as well. But know that like if you're paying down debt on your own home, the return that you're getting is equivalent to your after-tax interest rate. And so your own home, if your mortgage interest rate is 6.5%, then that's a return that you get from every dollar that you pay down debt. If you're paying down tax deductible debt, then your after-tax interest rate is probably closer to 4% or thereabouts because you know it's 6.5% and then you've got at least 30% tax. So after-tax interest rate is 4%, it means that the return is, is lower, but the return is guaranteed. So it can be a good strategy as well. Shares... Average out at about 4% income, 4% growth. They do pay, with shares can be quite tax effective that um, they, when they pay dividends, the dividends are typically paid with, with uh, what's called franking credits attached to them, which is like a tax credit that can reduce the amount of tax that you pay on your other income. But the big question with shares is where do you hold them? Do you own them in your personal name? Do you own them in a company? Do you own them in a bond? Do you own them in your super fund? Or do you do it some other way? Property, you've got gearing benefits. Uh, negative gearing gives you some tax deductions as well. But by far and away, the biggest benefit with property is the gearing itself in that you're using the bank's money to invest. Maybe you put in a $100,000 deposit on a $500,000 property. But all of a sudden, if you just invested your savings, your 100,000 savings, you'd have 100,000 of investments. If you're investing uh, 500,000, then you obviously got an investment that's five times the size. And so huge benefit that comes with that. Then you've got some tax benefits, which are the cream on top. And uh, look, when it comes to um, when it comes to crypto, that's essentially that there's no income generally on crypto unless you're doing staking. Um, a lot of people I feel like have learned that lesson the hard way, but um, there's the income is fully taxable in your personal name. And know that the ATO is is 100% watching when it comes to this stuff that a lot of people um, think that because crypto is anonymized or decentralized or um, you know it's anonymous that they don't that they can somehow avoid paying tax, but you can't because it's a ledger. It's crypto is a is a ledger and that means that there's a record of everything. So I'm going to get into some myths and mistakes here, guys. Um, again, I'm just going to go quickly through this to make some time for more questions because I can see a heap there. Um, first one, not tax planning before investing. Difficult and expensive to restructure things after you build a significant amount of money up in investments. So you want to plan before you build that critical mass. Also, investing just for the tax benefits. Big no-no in my opinion. If an investment isn't good without the tax benefits, it was probably never a good investment to begin with. And so you want to be really, really careful. We've seen people get burnt with buying properties to get big depreciation benefits, huge tax savings. But when, when, when all those benefits run out, you're effectively left with a dud property that doesn't grow. Total nightmare. Trying to stay in a lower tax bracket I mentioned. Offset versus redraw. This one catches a lot of people out, but know that there is a big difference between saving money in an offset account and paying it down into a redraw. Basically, where this comes up a lot is that people buy their first home. They want to pay down debt, so they aggressively pay down their mortgage. Then a few years down the track, they want to upgrade their property. And so they can redraw all this money out of their mortgage, which they do to put the deposit on um, their new property. And then they borrow the rest of the money from the bank. But what happens when you do that is because, the per because when you redraw, the purpose of that redraw is to buy your own home. That means that the interest that you pay on the debt that's redrawn is not tax deductible. 
And so that that redraw amount, the interest isn't deductible. Then you've got your new mortgage on your new property. That's also not deductible because it's your own home. And you've got this very small or low mortgage on your on your property, on your first property, which you now want to keep and run as an investment property, it leads to big tax headaches. Whereas if instead you were to put the money into an offset account and then you take it out of your offset account to um to to buy that same property then all of the debt on your first property remains fully deductible because the the purpose is quarantine. The purpose was always to buy that property. That property is now an investment, get nice tax deductions. And then the mortgage, the non-tax deductible mortgage on your own home is going to be lower as well. So it's a big, um, it, it's a big sort of sticking point that catches a lot of people out and can cost you quite a lot in tax when you, when you get this one wrong. Set and forget, look, the tax rules are changing all the time and your situation is changing all the time. And so you need to really be on the front foot with this tax planning stuff each year. Advice with an agenda is uh, is another one as well. And I see people that they get into you know, tax planning, their accountant helps them set up a trust and all of this sort of stuff. And sometimes it's good, you know, but sometimes it's not good. And so be careful if you've got someone that is... Um, you know, suggesting that you do all of this stuff, make sure you take a step back and just see, you know, is there a conflict of interest? Is there a benefit? Because your accountant is going to get paid when you set up tax entities. They're also going to get paid each year when you've got tax entities moving forward as well. And so uh, you just want to make sure that you're going to get a benefit that's in excess of the fee that you're that you're paying. Now, uh, look on this side, guys, I just wanted to show you how you can tackle your, your planning. Now, this is the planning process that we use at Pivot when we're helping people set up their financial plans, but it's the same process that anyone should follow if you're looking to plan around your tax, your tax planning, your tax strategy, and investing tax smart. First step, focus on what's important to you. Then you've got to clarify all of the moving parts, all of the things that are going to impact your strategy. What money have you got coming in? What money's going out? What's left over? How much money can you allocate to your tax saving strategies, your debt recycling, your negative gearing, your super contributions, all of those things. And then you need to explore your options. Understand the different pathways in front of you. Figure out what the financial benefits are. Figure out what the risks and trade-offs are. And then you're going to be more drawn to one path than the other. From there, you put it together into a really clear action plan where you know exactly what steps you need to take to turn your great ideas into results. And then you automate everything that you possibly can, set up the track to run on, and then it's about execution and refining that over time. Now, when you follow this process and you do it well, the, the results are you get to take confident action, that you're not going to get stuck on the fence, worry that you're going to make a mistake or a misstep, that you're actually doing this properly to pull the trigger and take action sooner. And I love helping people plan with their money, but ideas without action are meaningless because it's only when you take action that you start getting results. Also, you find the right balance between getting ahead with your money and living a good lifestyle. Both of these things are important, but finding the balance is really key here. And then you're maximizing the right opportunities, the right opportunities for you and ultimately fulfilling your financial potential. And so guys, uh, I'm going to get into Q&A in a sec, but I just want to share this model with you talks about from getting from where you are to future state when it comes to your money. And the reality is that in the future, you're going to be somewhere on the spectrum. Some of you are going to be doing really well, others not so well. Now, when people think about getting from where they are to where they want to be financially, um, they think about their progression like a straight line, but it's not a straight line because of the compounding impact of time and money. So if you're not 100% on track to end up exactly where you want to be with your money, you need to do some stuff to what we call jump the line. You need to set up that investment account, be smarter with your tax planning, um, whatever the things are. And then from there, you just need to take the next step and the next step and the next step, which is easier because you're already on the path. But the thing is that the sooner you leave, the longer you leave it, the more time goes on the jumping the line part becomes more and more painful, <clears throat> excuse me, and putting yourself in the best position can become impossible. And so everyone's version of money success is a little bit different, but you know, if you're if success for you is that you want to be saving 10, uh, you want to have investment income of 10 grand a month, you need to save a certain amount of money today. If you wait a week, a month, a year, five years, all it means is that you need to save more and sacrifice more to end up in the same position. So the sooner you start with this stuff, the easier it's going to be and the less you have to do to actually get there. And so, uh, look, I'll, I'll leave you with this quote from, from Derek Sivers. It says, if information was the answer, we'd all be billionaires with perfect abs. 
I hope you guys have got some great ideas out of what we covered today, but know that, um, you know, ideas without action are meaningless. That you, It's only action that's going to lead to, to results. Now, guys, uh, this is what we do at Pivot Wealth as well. And so just uh, just before I get into the Q&A, um, you know, I, I, I just want to call out how we might be able to help. Now, we do a ton of content. So I've mentioned that at the start. I'll put the links up again, but you can check all of that stuff out for free. But with this stuff, we get that it's complicated. And when it comes to tax, it is complicated. Um and valuable to get it right. And so, you know, we're not special. It's not like we've got some super secret black magic. We just have a system with this stuff that works and you can do this in your own. Now, in the last nine years, we're just coming up to our ninth birthday next month, that we've helped our clients use these strategies and tactics to build over a billion dollars in wealth, which is something I'm super, super proud of. Um, and ultimately what we do is take all of those lessons and put the power in your hands. There are two ways that we help people. One is through one-on-one -on -one financial advice, where we help you map out your own financial plan, taking you from where you are to where you want to be. The other part, the other way is through our Smart Money Accelerator program, which helps you save more and invest smarter. Now, the one-on-one -on -one financial advice is where we build a plan with you um, and we do it together where we're doing a lot of the heavy lifting, covering all the planning and uh, property and tax strategies, and it's essentially done for you. This is ideal for people saving two grand a month or more. And the reason that that number's in there is because we get the financial advice comes with a cost and we want to make sure that we'll only take on a client when we can see that they're going to get more benefit out of it than what they're going to pay for our services. The Smart Money Accelerator is for, what is that about? Oh, there it is. Um, helping you save and invest more, build your own smart money game plan, crank up your investing. And it's ideal for people that are building their savings towards that two grand a month uh, figure. And so <laughs> I'll put the links up there. There's a link to our calendar if you want to chat about one-on-one -on -one financial advice. And this link goes to our Smart Money Accelerator. I've put on a discount um, code just for you guys on live today for the Smart Money Accelerator to give you a hundred bucks off. Uh, that expires at midnight tonight. So if you're keen to get around that, uh, you can check out all the details in the link there. I'm just going to pop it in, that into the chat as well so that you've got the links if you're watching on the phone. Um, someone just let me know if those links are working as well. That would be awesome in the chat. Uh, and yeah, guys, uh, I, I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, the, uh, like I said, well done for jumping on. Yep. Got some confirmation on the links. Thank you guys. Um, this is the ideal time to be doing this planning because most people don't think until the end of the financial year and it can be then too late. So nice one on jumping on today. Uh, and guys, you know, check out our, our upcoming events as well. I'm going to crack on with these questions because I can see that there's a heap here. Uh, hey, Ben, if I have a DIY super and trade stocks in my super, do I pay 15% tax or 50% capital gains tax on the profit if I held the stock for more than one year? So a super fund pays a maximum rate of capital gains tax of 15% and 10% if you've held the investments for more than one year. So in this case, it's 10%. Uh is this equivalent to say a hypothetical situation of salary sacrificing where your employment income before tax gets redistributed to another tax entity in the purpose of building wealth? I do not understand that question. Sorry. You, you can't stream your salaried income to another tax entity before you pay tax on it, unfortunately, if that's what you're saying. Um, otherwise, everyone just get paid through trusts and the ATO would ca collect a lot less tax revenue, unfortunately. Um. Are financial advice fees tax deductible? Generally, so under the ATO's rules that advice fees for uh, ongoing investment, uh, building ongoing investment income are generally considered deductible um, as well as advice around, ta around tax planning and tax strategies generally considered deductible. So uh, most of them are, uh, depends on exactly how it's structured. And so it's worth always asking that question, but um, generally a good chunk of them can be. And so um, there's a, there's a benefit uh, in doing that. Um, how much is the cost of running a trust? About between two and three thousand to set up, and about two and three thousand dollars a year to do the the tax return. Ah, uh, says, could you repeat how investment bonds are taxed? So, in an investment bond, the income is taxed at a maximum rate of thirty percent. 
and capital gains are taxed at 10%, uh, sorry, if they're held for 10 years or more, uh, received entirely tax-free. I hope that one helps. Um, how much are we looking to engage? If how much are we looking at to engage a financial planner to get a financial plan? Look, the average cost of financial advice in Australia is about eight thousand dollars. I think the last time I saw it, that's for an initial plan and then some ongoing support to to make that happen. There's quite a range there, so it depends on exactly what you're looking for with that. But uh, essentially, that is the average uh, the, the average cost there as well. Uh, when you say cash needs to be adjusted for inflation and tax, isn't that the same with shares as well? Uh, yes, it is. Although um, the tax rates are generally lower with shares because of the franking credits and the fact that with shares, because you're get, getting capital gains, which are taxed at a lower rate because of that 50% CGT discount, it means that the tax is lower. The other side of the coin is that tax, um, the returns are generally adjusted for um, inflation with companies where, uh, like in the moment we're in this inflation crisis, and so the companies are putting up their revenue and so their returns get a little bit uh, protected there as well. Uh Adriana says, what's the major difference between the one-on-one -on -one advice versus the smart money accelerator? The one-on-one -on -one advice is we do the plan with you and for you. The smart money accelerator, you do it yourself. The smart money accelerator is a lot cheaper because you're doing the work. Uh, guys, awesome. Look, I I can see that there's, there's so many questions there. So I really appreciate you guys getting into that. Uh, feel free to hit me up on socials if you've got more questions uh, that you get answered. I love that fodder for our content as well. Um, guys, uh, it's, been, it's been real. Uh, thanks for tuning in and nice one on taking action. I'll catch you at the next one. Uh, check out our content if you want more. And uh, yeah, guys, thanks again. I will catch you next time. Bye for now. Trying to figure out how to end this thing. How do I end it? I don't even know. <laughs> Goodness me. Oh no. Peace out.